The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so today I'm going to sort of take a more empirical approach, and I feel like I've done a lot of theory in this class. So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play through the hands of an online attorney, so that I played, and sort of show you the most interesting hands and show you exactly what I did. I don't think I'm going to finish the whole tourney today, but um, I'm going to go through the first part, and I'm only going to talk about a few theoretical concepts, but mostly just go through the hands. Okay, so... It's, it's a $55 buy-in tournament on party poker, and it's a fairly small field. So this is a tournament I, I played recently. Um, and, okay, so, so let, let's just get into the hands. I'm only going to show you the, the hands where I did something at the start. And we will start with a bit of theory, okay? So this is, this is the situation. It's folded to this player, and so we have king-queen here. And it's a hand where we're in position, and he raised from late enough position where I think our hand is too good to fold. So if, dream, if dreams crushed, if, if the guy who raised was from under the gun, let's say, <laughs> then, um, then I might have, I, I probably would have folded, because against an under the gun range, king, queen, also it kind of gets crushed. But against a range from high jack minus one or low jack, I think king, queen is good enough to play. But... The question is sort of, what do we do? Do we raise? Do we call? I don't think folding is the end of the world. You know, I think it's slightly profitable to play, but it's not like you're giving up a ton of equity by folding this. So what do we do? Okay, so I'm going to start out with a bit of theory. So I haven't really talked about this. So this is. So I want to talk a bit, a bit about pre-flop re-raising theory. So in this situation. I don't want to just talk about what to do with this hand, right? This is how, throughout this class, I've been saying we shouldn't think about poker. We should always think about the general situation. What's the range of hands we could have? What's the range of hands they could have? And how do how should both players play their overall strategy with their entire range of hands? So, okay, so there's a few interesting things to think about here. Um, so there's sort of a dilemma. So if we think about our overall strategy, um, okay, so first first thing you notice is how many bets deep is it effective? How many, how, what's the stack size effectively? It's about, it's about 28, right? I think, uh, so yeah, we have about the same amount of chips. We have like 28 and a half big blinds. That's clear to everyone? So it's important that it's fairly deep here. So the, the stack size, the effective stack size is 28 and a half big blinds. And... So what's the issue? It's sometimes in this spot, we have a hand that's good enough implied odds to play in position, but it's not really like a good hand that we're trying to raise and make the pot bigger with. Like an example of this is like King Jack suited, or like King Queen off, I think is a good example too. It's a hand that's good enough to play, but not a hand that's good enough that we necessarily want to raise and make the pot bigger. On the other hand, sometimes we have a hand that you want to raise and hope you get along with, like aces. Right, so we do have the we have these sort of two types of hands that we want to play in this situation, but if we play according to our hand, it can become too predictable, right? So, so this is like a somewhat intuitive strategy. So you know, let's suppose this was our strategy. Let's suppose our strategy was with the best hands that we're hoping to get it all in with. Let's say in this spot, uh, pocket tens plus an ace king. I think that's reasonable as um, as the set of hands we're willing to and happy to go all in with. So pocket tens plus ace king, and then we call with uh, f pocket fives plus ace jack off, ace ten suited, king queen off. Um, it's, uh, so this, I'd say this is a reasonable strategy to play. But um, what are some problems with this sort of intuitive exploitative strategy? Uh, um, yeah. People are just going to fold to your aces and pick up money from you when you don't have the top hand. Okay, great. Yeah, um, good, good. So yeah, so that's a yeah, that, that's a good point. So basically, right? So people, if we if we only raise with pocket tens plus, people can just fold pretty easily, right? Because they know that we have a great hand whenever we raise. Good. Um, okay, what's another issue? This one's a bit more subtle. What's what sort of another issue? Right. So one issue is when we raise, it's obvious we have a great hand. And so on a similar line, another issue. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, did you? Yeah, if we call them they know we're Right, exactly. Okay, good, yeah. So, so the, uh, an almost bigger issue here is if we play like this, when we call, people know we can't have aces. So, you know, one of the guys behind, like this guy, Alight, might just be able to raise, and they'll, they're going to know we're going to be fairly weak, and we're going to have to fold most of the time. Right? So basically, this is not a really balanced strategy. So what can we do? Well, we could raise some assortment of hands from the call category to balance it out. We could call some hands from the raise category to some small percent of the time, like play a randomized strategy where you raise aces 80% of the time and call aces 20% of the time to balance it out. Um, there's some other more extreme things you can do that I don't think are good in this situation, but are reasonable when the stack size is different. So I think if it's shallower, let's say only 20 big blinds deep, then just raising all hands, just raising the top X percent of hands is a decent strategy because it, 20 big blinds is sort of shallow enough where if you raise, you, you're kind of committing your whole stack anyway. And if it's deeper then like if it's 100 big blinds deep, some players will like to call 100% of the hands. They'll just never raise. Um, I don't think it's like the optimal strategy, but it's not an unreasonable strategy when if you're 100 big blinds deep and you have position, it's not terrible, and then your range is completely disguised because you're playing all your hands the same preflop. So these are some reasonable solution ideas. Um, so here's a sort of a better solution. So, so, so this will sound really cool. Um, compared to the previous slide, which is instead of raising some of the call hands as, as a bluff, essentially, to balance out the times we raise with a good hand, what if we actually we bluff raise the best hands that aren't good enough to call? So let me just, so we can look at this again, right? So our strategy was we're raising for value, uh, aka we're raising hoping to get called with 10s plus and ace king. We're calling with sort of the pretty good hands, like pocket fives plus ace jack, ace ten suited, king queen off, and then we're gonna we're gonna bluff raise hands that aren't positive expectancy to call. So like pocket fours, ace ten off, ace nine suited, hands that are even weaker than the call hands. But in some sense, if we if we bluff raise with these hands, the benefit is we're sort of not wasting them, right? Like let's say with these better hands, like let's say with ace jack off. I raise and my opponent goes all in. Well, I'm probably going to have to fold in this situation for 28 and a half big blinds. So I've sort of like wasted my ace jack. Whereas, you know, if I did it with ace 10 instead, then I get to call with my ace jack, which I know is plus easy to call, and not waste such a good hand bluff raising. So this is a very important concept in poker. It's called polarizing. Um, and in general, you know, it's a sound strategy, right? By this like wasting argument, I'm saying, I'm talking about polarizing sounds like a pretty reasonable strategy, right? Because it, it ensures that you're not wasting your medium strength hands to, to bluff raise. So, so what's, what's a, an issue with it? So it can be exploited if your opponent um, calls your three bet. So, uh, so does anyone actually see does anyone actually see, so let's say in this case, suppose this was my strategy. Uh, so I'm raising pocket tens plus and, uh, and ace king, and I'm bluff raising the hands I, I listed here. Against the, okay, I'll give, I'll give a $20 gift certificate too. So like what's a specific board, let's say, where someone can exploit my strategy if this was my specific strategy? Um, this is just for illustration, but like, so, so look at my exact range and can someone say sort of what's, what's a very bad flop for my range? Uh, yeah. Uh, it flops high cards because they'll be thinking your range is generally high cards, but those are a bit lower. Uh, right. So, so if there's high cards, but we do have lots of aces and kings, right? Like if the flop comes like, um, like if there's an ace, then it's, it's pretty good for our range, right? Um, even though they might be able to fold easily, but we're still going to win the pot. But, um, but what is like a specific, what's a specific issue? Yeah. Well, like five, six, seven, somewhere in between. Okay, good. So five, six, seven is kind of bad for us, right? Because our range basically contains no fives, no sixes, no sevens. Um, but even five, six, seven, we still have like a bigger pair quite often. So what's like an even worse case? I argue that yeah, uh, high flush draw or a high straight draw. Straight draw. Uh, 
Yeah, but we can have those, right? We have ace nine suited in our range. We have king ten suited in our range. Something like a low pair, like four four eight. Um, yeah, we don't have fours or eights, but you know, on those boards like pocket jacks, even like ace king high is a pretty good hand in pocket jacks. There's there's something very specific we're missing. I mean, this is just for this example, but um, yeah. Maybe a pair of queens. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. So that's sort of what I was looking for. Yeah. You can come. You can come get this now if you want. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, like, so suppose this was our exact strategy. If the board comes queen high, then essentially they know that we our range is pretty bad because we don't ever have a queen, and we we I mean we could have kings or aces, but all of our other pairs are going to be smaller than queen. So I mean this is just a specific example, but I'm saying polarizing is in general a good concept by this argument that you're not wasting your good hands, but it can be exploited if your opponent knows the specific way in which you're polarizing and they just call your re-raise and see the flop and they'll be able to play very well on the flop still, even if you have some good hands and some blocks. Um, it can also be bad against unpredictable opponents because um, by the by the like ace jack ace ten argument again. Let's say you three bet with ace ten instead of ace jack as an attempt to polarize. But let's say your opponent is kind of bad and they might make a loose call in the situation with ace ten. Then you you, you would have really hoped to have ace jack instead of ace ten if they're going to call your raise with ace ten. I mean, if you so if you're polarizing, you're sort of assuming your opponent is going to play reasonably. Right, so the point is the reason why I don't want to sort of waste ace jack by raising is because my opponent's probably going to fold ace ten. But what if they might call ace ten? Then I really would have wished I I re raised with ace jack. So okay, the short answer is I'm not going to give a conclusive formula on how to play this situation because the short answer is it's complicated, and I don't think anyone essentially knows what the optimal strategy is yet. But um, in practice, I think just raising a mix of hands from the call category, mostly the offsuit hands which have worse implied odds, is is pretty good as part of your like bluff raising range. And calling the best hands from the raise category, like aces, like trapping a small percent of the time, just calling aces maybe a fifth of the time, so that sometimes you have it when you call, so that people can't just re-raise when you call. And also raise some of the best hands that aren't plus EV to call. So, so polarize a bit. Essentially, the short answer is it's complicated. And you need to do you need to do a bit of everything with all sorts of hands. But um, I just wanted to sort of talk about how complicated this situation can be. All right. Uh, so okay. So let's get back to the hands. So what I decided to do here was following the the thing I said about re-raising with offsuit hands. I decided to. So I decided to raise here to 555, and so I think this is about the right sizing because we're making it about 2.5 times his raise, and essentially we're bluffing here. And our hand is good enough where it's not the end of the world if they call because we have a lot of chances to hit top pair, and if we do, we're probably good because they're probably going on with ace king or ace queen preflop. But essentially we're bluffing. I'm definitely hoping he folds, and and he does. So okay, we take down the pot. Uh, okay, so so the very next hand, I actually just noticed this during uh, when I was replaying through the hands. So I didn't notice this. I didn't notice this during the tournament actually. But so what do you notice? It's actually we're actually in the in the exact same situation again, right? <laughs> but we have different cards. So it's good that you know we thought about our overall strategy when we played that hand because you will end up in the same situation again with different cards. So okay, so along the same lines, so you know, but at the time, you know, I was probably playing like 15 tables or more, so I wasn't really paying attention. I probably didn't I probably didn't remember that I re-raised my opponent the hand before. But playing through this, it actually yielded a really good result because what happened was they didn't believe my three bet the second time around, and they went all in with, you know, pocket sevens. It's not a terrible hand, but it's definitely, I think, a weaker hand than they would usually go all in there with. But I guess they didn't believe my re-raise after the previous hand. So this also sort of illustrates the importance of, like you said, of sometimes having a bad hand when you re-raise so that people will give you action when you do have a good hand like pocket checks. Okay, so 
Okay, so let's go on. And so I'm only playing through the hands that I that I essentially played at the start of the tournament. So so we doubled up. The starting stack was three thousand. We got six thousand. Now we get ace queen. We raise, and we get called here. And here, this guy makes it. So this is a different player because we eliminated the guy who used to sit here. And they make it 755. And I decide to fold here. I think ace queen offsuit is just a bit too weak. I think going all in is. It wouldn't be terrible, but I think where when we raised from fairly early position under the gun plus one and this hijack called, they're not going to be doing this as a bluff very often. And their re raised to 755. I think usually commits them. It's not guaranteed that they're going to they're going to go all in if we they're they're going to call us if we go all in. But I think most likely they will, and they're going to be ahead of our range. So I decide to fold. It's a fairly tight fold. So does this guy. Okay. So yeah, I'm just going to continue playing through my hands from the tournament. If if you have any questions, just stop me and ask. Okay, so this is sort of a weird hand, and I actually think I played this hand quite terribly. So, okay, so this guy calls, which I said we should never do, but I guess he doesn't take my class. Um, <laughs> okay, so we get queen 10 here, we check, we see a flop. Uh, so we flop uh, two over cards, a back for a flush draw, and a gutter straight draw. So I decided to lead into it, and so lead, lead my draws out, hope he folds. He calls, and the turn is a three. And then here, so this is where I sort of, he decided to sucker bet me. So I talked about how, you know, he should only be doing this if he doesn't respect me. Because, I mean, in this case, it's, you know, it's not a completely insignificant fraction of the pot. It's like one-sixth. So he is actually getting some substantial payment into the pot. But it's still fairly small. And the main thing it does is it gives me an opportunity to check raise. But I'm not going to. I don't think. I don't think they're going to fold often enough. There's a lot of draws they're going to call me with, and I'm going to have to bluff again on the river. So I decided to just call, which is reasonable. So this is where I think I played the hand poorly. So the river completes a lot of draws, but doesn't complete my hand, and I just check it down. I just check it, which the, at the time I didn't lead out because I thought. You know, the fact that I only called the turn and suddenly decided to bet big on the river would probably get called. But I think it's just not a balanced way to play the hand because plenty of times I will have clubs or, you know, or I'll have jack 10 or something. I'll have a jack and I will want to bet for value. And here when I have a hand that essentially has no chance of winning the, sh winning the hand at showdown, like essentially I'm giving up the pot for sure if I check because my queen high will never be good. I should definitely be bluffing. So I, I didn't, which I regret, because I let him take down the pot with a pair of threes. Um, but yeah, I guess he kind of played that hand well. Uh, he called 8-3 suited, and I guess he made money from me, because I didn't play very well from the big blind. Uh, okay, so the next hand, we get king-jack offsuit here. We open probably one of the weakest hands I'm opening from this position. I think probably in my recommendations, this is not in the list you should open from uh, hijack minus one. But I decided to open because I'm bored, I guess. And we get three colors. Okay, so the flop is four, six, four with two hearts. So I decided to continuation bet here. I think it's a fairly marginal spot. I think just giving up is okay. I definitely wouldn't have stabbed at the pot if I didn't have the if I didn't have the king of hearts. But um, the fact that I have a backdoor pretty good flush draw, I decided to bet and just hope that everyone folds. And we do get that, which is, which is pretty nice. OK, so, so you know our, our stack is hovering around the same size. We've won some hands, lost some hands. It's still early in the tournament. The blinds have gone up a bit, but it's still far away from the payouts. OK, so we get queen jack on the button, and and this guy just goes all in for a lot of bets. Um, I mean, it's I guess it's not that many. It's like 35? No, sorry. It's, yeah, it's about, it's about 30, 35, right? Uh, so, um, so, I mean, I fold here, obviously, but I thought a bit about, like, his range, and, you know, it's possible his range is 
like entirely. So I talked about this in a previous class. When do you want to be going all in for a huge size? It's essentially with hands that are pretty good to get all in with preflop, but have terrible postflop implied odds in this situation. And what were the hands that I listed there? It's essentially small pairs, right? Like pocket twos. You really don't want to see a flop. It's it's quite a good hand preflop, but. You really don't want to see a flop because it's pretty much always three higher cards are going to come, and you're just going to be playing this guessing game, trying to guess whether your opponent has a pair. And the other type of hand is like ace two offsuit, where once again, you, you know, you have an ace preflop, which is decent, but you're just going to be playing a guessing game on most flops. So, you know, it probably if I had a very strong read on him, and I, if I had like jack ten suited here. Calling is maybe not that bad because you're like a coin flip against ace two offsuit, and you're like a 54% favorite against pocket threes. So, I mean, I fold it here because my hand isn't suited, and just because there's a small chance they're going to have ace queen, and my read was nowhere near strong enough to to conclude that for sure their range was only small pairs and a six. Okay, so we lose a bit of chips. We're blinding down a bit. Here we get 10-2 suited, and so I call from the big blind with 4.5 to 1 odds. I think this is probably one of the weakest hands I call. I might not call like 8-2 suited, although it's close. I mean, you can make a case for calling 8-2 suited. So once again, my odds my odds are really good, but the reverse implied odds do, do sort of work against me quite a bit, since I'm going to be out of position and I have small cards, which will usually make a smaller pair than them. But I decided to call, and we fought a flush draw, which is pretty good. But I'm still going to check because this is a board where I'm just going to check to the preflop raiser and let them continuation bet, right? So I talked about leading in an earlier class, and I don't think this is a board where we should leading. We should be leading, and I think never leading is okay as well. So I decided to check, and they check back. So we turn the flush, which is great, and we bet 600 into 1080. So unfortunately, we don't get any action. So we take it down. Okay, uh, so the, the next, uh, I think this is one orbit later. So under the gun raises, small blind who is very, very short, who only has uh, seven and a half big blinds call, calls, and we decide to call with our seven, with our six and a half to one odds here, or six to one odds. So we flop. Uh, Queen Jack Five. So we have second pair with a backdoor straight draw and a backdoor flush draw, and the small blind goes all in for 1054 into 1380. So this is sort of, I think, a, a pretty close spot. I think if I knew for sure that Arden 1977 didn't have a hand here, I think calling is definitely fine. We're given about 2.3 to one odds. And I think second pair with these backdoor draws is more than good enough against his range. But, because um, I think his range will mostly be draws and top pairs and second pairs. Probably not bottom pair that often because they did call preflop from the small blind, which I don't expect most players would do with a hand like 7 5 suited. So, you know, we're not even that happy to call him, to be honest, but I probably would call. Um, but the fact that this guy here is behind, and they could raise, or they could call, and we have to make more decisions on future streets, I think really hurts us, and I think we should have folded. Uh, at the time, I decided, <laughs> I decided to call, so I, I don't know why, but I don't think this is a good play. I think it's it's just too risky, essentially. You know, it'll work most of the time, and we, and because most of the time, Artem will fold because they're going to see two players putting money in. But the times where they do have something, I'm going to have to fold, and it's going to suck. So, so we do call. Um, they actually had the same hand as us, so <laughs> it it worked out well. I guess we sort of took a bad beat because we could have made a flush, and they couldn't have. So we were technically ahead, but we got half the pot. Yeah. Um, So yeah, so I'm, I'm not going through my tournament history from uh, from maybe one month ago and saying I played every hand perfectly. When I look through here, I definitely yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of hands I wish I could replay. Um, so okay, so this hand I guess is fairly simple. So we have Ace King, and I think it's definitely good enough to get it all in here with. So as far as what my range is, I think I think um, sorry. 
Hmm? Oh, did you have a suggestion? Or not? Oh, no, no, I, I just saw this guy's uh, handle and it was. I thought it was funny. <laughs> oh. Um, okay. Sorry, you thought it was who? Funny. Oh, uh, okay. Just <laughs> sorry, sorry. Funny. Okay. No, yeah, don't ask me what my handle means. My handle is... Uh, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even read it. Um, okay. So... I think it stood for something. I probably made it when I was, like, 17, and... I think it stood for something, and I, I might, I probably don't remember what it says. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so we go all in here. Um, so this is sort of a no-brainer hand, but let's stop and think a bit about what our range should be. So I think with ace king, ace king and pocket tens, I think it's fairly easy to get it all in. I think with ace queen suited, I would get it in. Um, I think if I had ace queen offsuit, I would probably fold. Although, um, with ace-queen suited, actually, if this jet ski fun guy had as many chips as us, then maybe I would have folded. But the fact that we're actually not risking our entire 6250 against the two players who are in the pot is very relevant. Because, I mean, Arden covers us, and they could, in theory, pick up pocket aces, but it's much less likely for them to pick up pocket aces than this jet ski fun guy who's already in the pot. So the fact that they only have less than 20 big blinds as well helps our case a lot. So I would probably get it in with ace-queen suited plus, and then pocket pocket nines plus probably is what I'd get it in with here. Um, so we go all in and we beat ace-jack, which is, which is good, yeah. So I think ace-jack is slightly on the loose side. I mean, I think it's a fine play definitely to get it all in with ace-jack, but... Maybe they could have, maybe like they, because they do have more than twenty big blinds here. So I think maybe they could have considered calling or raising small and folding if someone like us entered the pot. But nonetheless, I think they played their hand fine. Okay, so the next hand we have pocket nines. So many. This guy raises. We call. So we're getting deeper now because we won the last hand. So now we've got we've got forty big blinds and we call. This guy also calls and. Liam Kidd goes all in for 30 big blinds, and so they get out of the way. I think this is actually a very close spot, so um, I do think one big uh, incentive to get it all in is I think it's not that likely that Liam Kidd has like pocket kings or pocket aces, because I think there's a good chance they would have just raised smaller, maybe, to try to sector people in. So I actually think I'm not <coughs> losing to too much here. And same with Arden. I think it's also very hard for Arden to have a good hand. So even though in the first example we talked about how um, sometimes you know calling with pocket aces here is a good play, but you know I said if one guy raised and you're the second guy, you should maybe call with pocket aces like 20% of the time. When it's two guys who have like when it's one guy who has raised, me who has called, and now you're deciding what to do with pocket aces. You know instead of 20%, you should be calling. It's literally like you know, maybe like 2% or 1% you should be calling with pocket aces. So, you know, if you combine, you multiply 1% by the probability of getting dealt pocket aces, which is around like 1 in 200, it's literally like 1 out of 20,000 that he has pocket aces here. So, um, so I'm not too afraid of him. So I, I really think getting it in is fine. But at the same time, you know, I don't think I'm ever a favorite here. I think their range is essentially like ace-king, ace-queen, maybe ace-jack suited, and then essentially pocket tens, pocket nines, pocket jacks, pocket queens, maybe occasionally pocket eights. So I could have done an exact equity calculation on poker stove, and if I did, it probably would have been very, very close. But I decided to fold, and they take down the pot. Okay, so the next hand we get ace jack. We raise from under the gun. This uh, this guy goes this guy goes all in for six big blinds. We're basically committed here, even if we think he's crushing us. So I call and we lose the ace king. Not really too much we can do here. Um, although this does illustrate one concept, which is when there are stacks behind like Zarbazan who are short enough that they can commit you by going all in you should be slightly less incentivized to open speculative hands here. Like, say I had 10-9 suited. I think, while normally I would c consider opening 10-9 suited here as a steal, 
it's a huge disincentive to steal here with 10-9 suited when someone like Zarbazan can just pick up, you know, even a hand as weak as like ace-jack suited and or ace-jack off suited and go all in and beat our 10-9 suited. So, um, but I mean, ace-jack is more than good enough to still raise here and we unfortunately run into ace-king. Okay, so the next hand we get ace-jack again and uh, the, the same guy who just doubled up through us goes all in, and here I call him because here, the, even though there's more chips, the positions are a lot later, and specifically, uh, they went all in for 14 big blinds when no one else was in the pot. So their range is, you know, their range isn't super duper wide, but it's definitely wide enough that Ace Jack, I'm happy to call here. As far as what my range is, I think. Um, I think I wouldn't call with ace-10 offsuit, but I would call with ace-10 suited. So probably ace-10 suited, and I think I'd call with king-queen suited, but not king-queen offsuit. And the smallest pair I get it in with is probably pocket sixes, I think. Um, maybe pocket fives. <coughs> okay. Yeah, probably pocket fives is too loose. Yeah, probably pocket sixes. So we call, so unfortunately we lose the king-10 suited, so he doubles up through us again, and we're kind of short now. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, on that last hand, uh, why go all in yourself? Why not just call his all in? Oh, okay, good question, yeah. So, yeah, this is a good question. So in this case, the two plays I'd say are, are fairly close to equivalent. Um, because, okay, so what's the difference, right? They're, they're going to be the same most of, almost always because check raise is just going to fold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, right, but okay, so what's the difference? The difference is if we don't go all in, then check raise, if let's say he picks up aces, right? Sure. Then he can just go all in and we're basically forced to call him because we can't, if we, if we put in 4,118 4, and they go all in, we can't really fold for only 3,000 more. We can't really fold pre-flop with... 41 odds. Would that change if you were the big stack? If like you had check raises stack and he had your stack? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if we had the same stack as check raise here, I would just call, and then if check raise goes all in, I would probably fold. Okay. But I'm, I mean, I'm also going to call here with pocket aces, so they can't just look down at pocket twos and go all in and bully me around. Okay. Yeah. So, so my strategy, if we had their stack, would be to, um, would be to call my entire range that I plan on playing. Okay. But in this case, the only thing calling does is it gives him more options. Like, let's say they had a very marginal Marginal's situation. Sure. Like, let's say they had king-queen suited. Yeah. I think if I if I only called, they could maybe argue for calling themselves with king-queen suited yeah. and seeing a flop. Whereas if I go all in, I think they're forced to fold king-queen suited. Basically, have a better chance of making him fold. Exactly, yeah. I'm just giving him fewer options. But it, it's very, very marginal. Like, it affects, it affects it basically specifically for maybe king-queen suited. Like, it affects basically for one hand, or, I don't know, maybe, like, two or three hands. But, yeah, it's, it's very good. But, um, but you might as well minimize the options you give your opponent, so. Yeah, like, I'd say the, the minimum stack size I would need before I call instead of go all in with is maybe, um, I think maybe, like, 13,000. Yeah, I think at 13,000, it's sort of more than I, I'd want to risk against this. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so now we're kind of short. So we blind down for a bit, we don't get cards, and when you don't get cards in a tournament, there's not really much you can do other than blind down. Not like go all in with crap and just lose. So we blind down for a bit, but we're fortunate to pick up kings. So this is sort of a no-brainer. We go all in, there's no point trapping because they're guaranteed to call us. And we get called by ace five, and we win, which is good. Um, okay, so... The next hand we get 8-7 offsuit, and against a button raise, I think calling is fine. I think their range is just going to be wide enough, where even though the reverse implied odds, once again, really don't work in our favor, we just have to sort of realize the equity from 4.5 to 1 odds, so I'm going to call. And so we flop nothing, I'm planning to just check fold. So I check, they check back, turn is a 4, once again we have nothing. I could bluff here, but I figure, you know, I'm not really looking to make a big bluff with this hand because I have no draw, no pair, there's no point. Um, but I will probably look to make a bluff on the river if they also check, just because I, whenever you have, like, no chance of winning the pot, then 
and it's the river, then making a bluff is not unreasonable. But in this case, bluffing is kind of bad because with any club, they might just call me because any club is going to have some equity. So, so I check. They check back. The river is a fourth club, which is I think a pretty good card for me because um, you know I can easily represent a small club, and if I did have a small club, I am definitely value betting. So you know it's a pretty good card for me to bluff, and they're probably going to have to fold king high. So. So I bet, and I don't think I have to bet fairly big, you know, I, I'm just looking for a size where they have to fold sometimes and they'll have to pay me off sometimes when I have to have a, when I have a small club. And so they raise me here, which is, <laughs> which is pretty weird. I don't really, I still don't really have a good idea of what I think he has. Um, I mean, I'm certain they have me beat, you know, so I, I just fold, like, you know, we could think a bit about doing something crazy like go all in, but... It would just be weird. I, I think it's unnecessary. You know, we've got nothing. So I just fold. Yeah, I don't really know. Maybe they just had, like, a slow play flush. It's possible they had, like, a king high flush here, and they slow played the flop. They decided to slow play the turn again because the turn sort of didn't hit anybody. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So, so I fold here. I mean, it's possible they just had a high club, but I feel like with a high club... They should have bet at some point to sort of just because the a good flush draw is just has enough equity. But nonetheless, I guess we'll never know. That's one benefit of calling. You get to find out what your opponent had. Um, okay, so the next thing we have Queen Jack. We've got 12 bets. I just go all in. 12 is around the cutoff of, right, like I said, 12 is sort of the cutoff where if you have 12 bets or less instead of raising, just go all in. And that's what we do. So we get called, but... So this is actually a pretty sick board, yeah. So they flopped a full house, but we revered a higher full house. Um, it was... Yeah, it's sort of a waste because, you know, normally if this happens, you could win, like, a hundred big blinds from them, probably. But instead, we only won how many? Uh, eight big blinds. So it's sort of a waste, but whatever. Uh, okay, so the next hand, we got pocket fives, and... We raised to we raised to a thousand, and Liam kid goes all in again, and you know it's irritating. But I think once again I have to fold. It's I think I'm just I don't have enough equity to call like, given his range. Um, once again, it's a situation where it's a fairly big all in. So you know I could maybe not put them on aces. Although given that they've done this once, they're more likely to just do this with their entire range and play a strategy where they're just going on pre-flop a lot, so maybe they could have aces in their range, but nonetheless, regardless, I think it's not even that close. I just pulled. Um, yeah, we don't really want to call in frustration, because you saw what happened to the guy with pocket sevens when he ran into our pocket jacks in the earlier hand. Uh, okay, so I'll take a short break there, and then I'll finish up the rest of the hands in, like, two minutes. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so, so okay, I, I'm gonna get started. Uh, okay, so so okay, so the next hand we get we get king eight offsuit, and once again it's one of these situations where you know we're not thrilled to be calling, especially now that our odds are even a bit worse because they actually made it two point two five x, actually a bit more like point three five x instead of two uh, x. So against degenerated, but I, king eight offsuit, two big cards, I think with when we're sort of not that deep, the reverse implied odds don't work against us that much, so so we call. And we get a good free flop. Um, so we check, because once again, I'm, I'm checking my entire range. That's how I choose to play my strategy. And they bet. And so this is sort of, I think, uh, I think this is a somewhat close situation, because I think... Um, there are some draws, right? There is a flush draw, and there are a bunch of straight draws if you if someone has jack-10 or queen-jack or queen-10. So I do think there is a decent amount of incentive to just check-raise all in, right? So in the second lecture, I showed you a bunch of examples where on boards like this, you can check-raise all in with your good hands and check-raise all in with your draws, and it's a pretty balanced strategy um, because when you have a good hand, you have a good hand, and when you have a draw, you have lots of outs when you get called. Um, but in this, and another advantage of going all in is, let's say I had like, let's say I had like 10-9, I would probably want to be raising. Because with 10-9, even though we have a pretty good hand, we kind of sort of want to protect our hand, right? We don't really want a jack, a queen, or an ace to come that much. So 
it's close, but um, but in the end, I decided to call, and I think I and I think I decided I'm just gonna play pretty close. Pretty much my entire strategy, I'm just gonna call here. Um, as tempting as it is, like let's say I had I had uh, ace two of diamonds, or let's say like queen six of diamonds to check raise all in. I think it's a board where you know it's already paired, and if I have a flush draw, I still have lots of opportunities to bluff on the river. And if I have a good hand, there's not that many outs, and especially when I have a king. So I'm just gonna call and hope that the board comes out well, which I guess it does. Um, <laughs> so. So I check again because this is how I'm playing Jack Ten. This is how I'm playing <coughs> all my hands essentially. So they check back. The river is kind of bad for us, but I think it's hard for them to have a king at this point. So I just bet out uh, about a bit more than half a pot, maybe sixty percent of pot. Yeah, sixty percent. And and they oh they, so they actually call me with a seven, which I think is pretty reasonable. Like I think a seven is a fine call against my strategy. Um, because I could have easily had Jack Ten or Queen Ten or Queen Jack here. Um, although I probably also play a nine the same way, so they are also paying off my nines. And so one good thing actually, so this is one uh, interesting thing to think about that's a sort of advanced, but I think it's cool is the fact that they have Ace Seven. I think makes their call a lot better than if they had say Ace Ten or Ace Jack. And the reason for so even though ace seven is in some sense a worse hand than ace ten and ace jack, they're they're the same on this board. And I think it's a the the problem with ace ten and ace jack is if they have a ten or a jack, it's less likely I have a ten or a jack. So you know because when they're calling with ace seven, essentially what they're hoping for is hoping for me to have jack ten or queen ten or queen jack. So if they have a ten or a jack, it just decreases that chance. So it's almost like a7 is a better hand to call with than ace jack. So, but nonetheless, you know, with any ace, I think calling here is reasonable because I do have plenty of bluffs. Any missed straight draw, any missed flush draw, I will bluff in the same way on this river. Okay. Uh, so the next hand. So we yeah we won a bunch of pots, which is nice. So we we built our stack up. So we get pocket fours here, and this guy raises it to twelve hundred. Pocket fours is definitely a hand where I want to be bluff re-raising with. So I'm not, you know, I'm not hoping to get called when I re-raise here, but it's a hand that does quite well against the range of hands I get called by because a lot of times it'll just be ace king, ace queen, and 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 they will fold quite a large percent of the time. So I definitely want to raise. The only question is how do I raise, right? I could just go all in. Which has the benefit that they can't call and try to hit a pair because that would actually be bad. Like let's say I made it, let's say I only re-raised to three thousand here. It's actually kind of bad if this guy calls with this queen jack trying to hit a pair because that's actually the best strategy. That they're, they're basically their obvious strategy is good against my hand. So I want to either go all in, which sort of denies them that opportunity, or um, or I could. But the problem with going all in is let's suppose check raise picks up. A hand, right? Then I'm going to be losing with my pocket fours. So you know there is this delicate balance here, and this is why um, in t this is why I think tournaments are interesting because you know there's plays that are good against big stacks and plays that are good against small stacks. But in reality, in a tournament, there's going to be big stacks and small stacks at the table, and often you do have to compromise between the lesser of two evils. And that's sort of what I do here. So I decided to raise these 3,600, which is bigger than I'd usually make it. Usually I'd make it maybe like 3,000, but when this guy is this sh short, uh, Raffle, lol, boom, I, um, <laughs> I don't really want to let them just call. But uh, on the other hand, I want to be able to fold if one of these two guys, Check Razor or Vamson, picks up a hand. So I sort of compromise between making it 3,600. They both fold, and this guy also folds, which is, I guess, an ideal result. Okay, the next hand we have ace queen offsuit, and we make it sixteen hundred. So I, I I know I've said make it two point two five x, and I I stand by that. I think that's a good strategy. I think at the time I'm just so once again I'm probably still playing a lot of tables, and I'm kind of lazy, so I'm too lazy to type in like eighteen hundred manually. Whereas the software defaults to just two x, so I tend to just two x, but. I think it's probably not the theoretical optimal strategy. I would guess that the optimal thing to do is closer to 2.25x. Uh, so Vamson calls us in position, and you know, so so immediately I could think of it like, what is their range? Because it's a spot where I expect him to 
go all in with most of their good hands. So the question is, you know, are they trapping me, or do they literally just always have a hand like Jack Ten suited, King Queen, or so, something like that? So, so immediately it's it's sort of an interesting spot because I expect them to mostly be raising when they want to play their hand. Okay, so we flop uh, four ten nine, and it's definitely a pretty bad board for us overall. Like I think you know if. Like regardless of their strategy, like if their strategy is to trap us sometimes, then this, this board is just terrible. And even if their strategy isn't to trap us, they've always got a straight draw on this board because they're going to have king queen or queen jack or something. So I think objectively it's a pretty bad board. Maybe they could have ace jack or ace queen themselves. Although ace queen, I think they're definitely raising preflop, so probably just ace jack. Um, so I do think we're not in great shape here, but. I decide to bet anyway, essentially just banking on my ace of clubs. I, I definitely wouldn't be betting this without the ace of clubs, but my strategy is to bet, and if I get called, I'm going to go all in on any club turn, any jack, queen, or ace turn. So essentially any club turn, I have the nut flush draw. Any um, jack turn, I have, a good, I have a good straight draw with two overcards, and any queen or ace turn uh, gives me pairs in my hand. So I just think there's enough turns where I can basically continue bluffing, continue barreling on. That one barrel has to be okay. But I'm only making this play because I have the ace of clubs. Like, I think even with the queen of clubs, I probably would have just given up this hand. Um, but we do get a fold. So I guess they probably had ace jack. That's probably their most likely hand. Maybe something like pocket sevens they folded. Yeah, so that sort of shows you the importance sometimes of backdoor draws. Because, like, let's say they had pocket sevens here. Like, let's say they called with pocket sevens, which I don't think is unreasonable. If I didn't have the ace of clubs, I'm going to just have to end up giving up on a bunch of turns, and they would take down the pot with their pocket sevens. But because I have the ace of clubs, it's just very, very unlikely they end up winning the hand with a pair of sevens, because I'm going to shove a lot of turns, and they're just going to have to fold. Okay, so the next hand we get queen jack again. And we raise here. And so this thing got Damson, they call, and we get a good flop. Um, so, so I bet, okay, so I'm going to talk about this. I, so I bet 1600 here, which is quite small. It's like 40%. It's like less than 40% of pot. I might have done it out of laziness, but, or I might have just done it because of my cards, because I have two pair and I'm trying to sucker him in and get him to put in all his money slowly. But... Looking back, I definitely don't think this is how I want to be playing my entire strategy on this flop. Like, I think I want to be betting at least half the pot when there's a flush draw, a straight draw, like a bunch of straight draws. I definitely think this bet is way too small. It's just on average, even if, even if I have a pretty good hand, let's say like queen nine, there's just a lot of bad cards for me that I don't want to be betting this small on this board. So I don't know if at the time I just like misclicked and messed up or I was lazy and I just wanted to make it 2x, or I specifically had a read that I could exploit this player by betting small, but this is not a balance. This is not how I would like to balance my strategy, and if you ever see me doing this, most likely I have a really good hand, as I do in this case. Um, so unfortunately it doesn't work. But So I'm going to talk about this a bit more. So I'm going to jump back to theory just for a bit. Um, so I want to talk, I don't think I've talked about this before, but I want to say that bet sizing depends on board texture. So let me explain what I mean here. So essentially there's two types of boards. There's dry boards and dry boards. So I hate this terminology because these are two words that mean opposite things and they sound very similar, especially if you don't enunciate, but it's dry and dry. Um, maybe I can't pronounce them well, but okay. So dry boards is basically boards where the winner is mostly decided by before the river, and you're either way ahead or way behind. Dry boards is basically boards with a lot of flush draws, straight draws, where every subsequent cards card can change the board a lot, and it's hard to fold because all hands have equity. So in reality, most boards, you know, they're somewhere in between. It's a spectrum. But okay, so what are some characteristics of dry boards? Well, a board tends to be dry if it's paired. Like four, four, eight. That tends to be pretty dry because not much is going on. Most people have missed that board. Um, a board is dry if the highest card is big. Like if the highest card is an ace, then against someone with an ace, if you don't have a place flush or straight draw, you're already kind of drawing close to dead. Um, whereas you know if the highest card is a ten, then if you have a queen, you always have an opportunity to turn a queen and beat them. 
Um, it's dry if there's no middle cards for straight draws, if there's no flush draws, um, or I'd say if there's already four to a flush or already four to a straight, then it's also sort of dry because, like, if there's already four diamonds, then it's also sort of decided who wins already. Like, if you have a big diamond, you're just pretty much guaranteed to win, barring some full house. Um, same with four to a straight. If it's, like, nine, ten, jack, queen, if you have a king, you're just pretty much guaranteed to win. And so on the other hand, what are dry boards? It's, it's sort of the opposite, right? Small cards, why small cards? Because everyone's going to have over cards, which is six outs. Flush draws or three to a flush is also very dry because if there's three to a flush, then someone with just an, any card of that suit has a flush draw. Uh, boards with straight draws. So how should your play change on these two types of boards? Um, well, on dry boards, you can bet pretty small fractions of the pot on the flop in turn. And your opponent might not have the odds to call. So, like, you know, if the flop is ace, ace, two, or maybe ace, ace, seven with no flush draws, you can bet, like, a fifth of the pot, and your opponent is still going to have to fold a lot of their hands, because if you've got an ace, they're just way behind. Um, what's another characteristic is any draw might be good enough to make a bluff. So, like, if the board is ace, ace, seven with no flush draw, and you've got, like, eight, nine with a backdoor flush draw, that's a pretty good hand to make a bluff because you've got um, you've got three to a straight and three to a flush, which is sort of the most you could possibly ask for on that flop with respect to draws. And an another aspect of playing dry boards is sort of slow playing. Tricky plays are good because the thing that matters isn't preventing your opponent from seeing the turn in river and not letting them see outs. The thing that matters is sort of convincing your opponent of that you have a good hand when you don't, or like convincing them that you don't have a good hand when you do. So it's all about tricking your opponent, disguising these tricky... I mean, it, I shouldn't say that. It's not all about... Like, simple play can still be good on dry boards, but in general, slow playing is reasonable, and, and tricking, trying to trick your opponent is, is more important. Whereas on dry boards, you know, you just got to bet large fractions of the pot before the river because every hand has so many outs. You really don't want to be giving them good odds to call. And on the flop and turn, if you don't have anything, then just don't put any money in because... Bluffing is pretty moot because so many hands aren't folding because they have outs. Um, and yeah, don't really slow play. If you have a good hand, similarly, just put all the money in right away because they're going to call very often because they're always going to have some outs. So that's roughly how, uh, how the play changes. Okay so, uh, okay, so I'll come back to this. We'll see these hands in a bit. So coming back to this queen-jack hand, the reason why I think my bet is too small is because I would consider this Queen Jack 3 with a flush draw to be a fairly dry board, fairly close to the dry end of the spectrum. And for that, and I said, you know, you have to bet big fractions of the pot. And here I am betting close to a third of the pot on the flop. So I think it's just not a good strategy, but um, I take the pot down. Okay, so the next hand. We have ace-queen offsuit, and so this guy calls. And so my rule was roughly, you know, raise it to 3x plus 1. So three. So you count how many limpers there are before you, and you add 3 to that, and you multiply that by the big blind is roughly what you raise it to. So in this case, 4,000. I make it 4,250. Um, if they decide to do some weird limp raise, by the way, like if they go all in here, I'm definitely calling. Uh, I'm just not going to believe them, and ace-queen offsuit is definitely good enough. So they decided to just call, which is a bit weird considering their odds aren't that good and they're out of position, but um, we flop three hearts and we have the queen of hearts, and in this situation I'm just betting, uh, I'm just betting pretty big into the pot, so I consider this to be a fairly dry flop, so I bet big. Um, and so even though I'm in position, so position is sort of an incentive to maybe bet smaller because you have position on later streets and you can control the betting better on later streets. But so this is a fairly big bet considering I'm in position, but I'm just happy to get it in here. Um, so contrast this with an earlier hand. I think I also had ace queen, um, except uh, it was only I only had three to a flush. And I said it was very important that I had the ace of the suit. But here it's just very hard for me to be in terrible shape. You know, like, in theory, they could have, I suppose, ace-9 with the ace of hearts. Like, that hand would be crushing me because I would be drawing to literally three outs to pair my queen. But it's just there's not that many combinations because it would involve an offsuit hand, which they're way less likely to have when they call me out of position. 
or it would involve a hand like pocket kings with the king of hearts, which is also pretty unlikely because they probably would have done some raising preflop. So I just think no matter what they have, I'm going to be in great shape here, and I just have more than enough outs to just gamble. And so they fold. <coughs> okay, uh, the next thing we have queen 10 off. So I open from under the gun. Um, I think it's fine. You know, it looks a bit loose, and it is, but I think in terms of raising some smaller cards to balance it so that I will sometimes have smaller cards in my hand, you know, you can't really ask for more than a suited connector. So queen 10 suited, I raise from under the gun, and the big blind calls when they're only, they only start the hand being 18 bets deep. So we flop 2 to 10 and I think, so this is a good example of, I think, a very dry board where there's really not much going on. Um, and it is possible they have a deuce, but just in general, there's no straight draws, no flush draws. I guess there are some overcards, but still it's pretty close to as, as dry as you can get. get. And they checked me and I bet 2,000, which I think is actually too big here. Like, to be honest, I don't think I needed to risk this much. I mean, I have a good hand, but, you know, if I had, if I didn't have a pair, I only want to be betting, like, 1,500. I think that's a fine size. I think betting 1,500 is more than enough on this board, just because there's really nothing going on. And, um, but I guess I was lazy. I bet 2,000, and, uh, and they call. So, so yeah, so this is the, the, so as you can see, there's a huge difference between my flop bet sizing depending on the texture of the board. And that's sort of what I want to do, drive. That's the point I wanted to drive across through some of these examples. So they call me. So we turn a six and they, they check. I'm just going to keep it simple and bet. I'm not going to try anything tricky. And obviously I'm not folding with top pair and a flush draw. So they go all in. I call. So we river a flush, and it turned out to actually be necessary, because they had a deuce. Um, so it is possible here, I think, for them to have a deuce. You know, I think their play preflop is, is a bit loose with 2-9 suited, but not completely terrible, because with 4.5 to 1 odds, nothing is really that terrible. But I guess, yeah, we get lucky. But I do think their call is a bit marginal, because we are under the gun, so you know, our range is fairly strong. So that's a nice pop to win. So we're a, we're a fairly big stack now. Um, I, I guess we're chip leader at the table. And check raise, min raises from there. And we have pocket deuces. I think definitely our hand's too weak to go all in with as a bluff against an under the gun opening range. So the only options really are call or fold. Uh, basically, our hand does have terrible reverse implied odds post swap though. So I think you know I think if you wanted to fold here, it wouldn't be terrible. But I guess I think calling is fine too with four point five to one. And also you know in some sense you do have odds to set mine here. I think because uh, because so the chances of hitting a third deuce on the flop is about one in eight. So my odds are only four point five to one. But there are implied odds in the case I do hit a set. So like literally if my strategy is call and fold unless the flop has a two on it, I don't think I'm losing a ton of money there. And you know, if there ever is a case where I where they check down and I get to take down the pot with just a pair of twos, then I'm just printing money by calling. So so I decided to call. The flop is the flop doesn't have a two, so it's bad, but you know, out of the flops that don't have a two, it's probably not that bad considering the, th the three and seven is not that likely to pair him when he's under the gun. But nonetheless, I fold, you know, like if I could do the cheat I talked about where I could disconnect and call and see the river, I definitely would. But, you know, if I call, I have to decide again on the turn whether to call and decide again on the river whether to call. And it's just not going to be a good situation, even though for this immediate bet, I think I definitely have odds to call uh, with a backdoor flush draw. And often they're just going to have ace king. But... It's just impossible to play the hand in. This sort of just demonstrates, you know, why it's very risky when you decide to play a hand like pocket deuces out of position, because it's just very easy to get roped in, right? Like, let's say I call here, and then I call the flop thinking they might have ace king, they bet small, so I have good odds, and I have a backdoor flush draw. So let's say I call, and then the turn is like the five of clubs or something, and then they bet like 40% of pot. Well, like, am I going to talk myself into a call again? 
maybe because now I hit a third club. But if I do, then if the river is something random, I have to. So it's just all these decisions that I'm not going to be able to make well. Whereas for my opponent, it's going to be fairly easy. They're going to just bluff their bad hands, value bet their good hands, and check down the hands in the middle, which beat me. Okay, so the next hand, we get ace king offsuit, and we raise, and the big blind calls. Flop is 9 2 7. So note that the big blind just got moved to the table, and they actually cover us. So, so they're, they're probably one of the biggest stacks in the tournament. Um, so they check to us. I decided to check back here, which I don't think is terrible, but I think is a bit of a scared play that I, w I think I would have rather saw myself bet. Um, you know, if it was shallower, like let's say we only had 20,000 chips, then I think just checking is good because if I bet, they're probably going to be check raising with a lot of their flush draws, straight draws, and then like pairs of nines or pairs of sevens. And I'm going to have to fold with a pretty good hand where I have two good over cards and a backdoor flush draw. But when it's this deep, you know, they, they really can't just check raise a nine because they're going to have to be worried about pocket aces on our part. So, so I think it's, we're not going to get check raised that often. And by betting, we just make the pot bigger when we do hit a king or an ace and also make it more likely that we can bluff them off a nine or a seven by the river. So I would have liked to see myself bet, but I don't think checking is terrible by the argument that I will most of the time, you know, by betting, I am folding out basically all the hands that I beat and keeping in all the hands that beat me. So it's close, but I would like to see myself bet. But as played, you know, if I'm going to check the flop, I'm not going to bet this turn because the whole point of betting the flop is so that I could potentially bet the turn and bet the river and get him to fold a pair of nines or a pair of sevens. But by now, I'm not going to really have any hope of getting him to fold a nine. And I'm just going to try to win the pot with my ace king high. And so yeah, I just check it down. Um, the river check, I think, is very, very obvious because I'm literally only getting called by better hands if I bet the river. So... They, so they have queen 10. I think they probably should have bluffed the river. I think queen 10 is weak enough where they're just very rarely winning the pot with queen 10 high that they basically need to bluff and then put me to a decision. But nice to win that. Okay, the next hand we have jack 10. So not too exciting. So this same guy who's now the button raises from the button and we call and we flop nothing. So the best thing to do is bluff off all your chips, but no, I just pull. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next hand is also against this Gar Garla EDU. So we're actually playing, so the two big stacks at the table are actually playing a lot of hands against each other. Um, I just call here with jacks. I think, I don't think it would be terrible to just raise and get it all in, but I think it's, it's, it is sort of unnecessarily risky. Like I think, um, I think it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a terrible play to just raise and get it all in, but it's definitely thin. Like you're not printing value by raising and getting it all in because if they re-raise all in, their range is going to be pretty strong, and pocket jacks is not really crushing them. So um, I think you need to have queens or better to really be hoping to get it all in against uh, this guy here. So with jacks, I just call, and also you know this protects my calling range a bit. Like let's say. Let's say, like, check raise thinks I'm weak and decides to make a play here, and they re raise to like 10,000. Then, if Garla EDU folds, I can come back around and go all in and sort of surprise them. So, it does protect my calling range a bit as well. I call, we get a 965 flop. Um, they check, and I bet. And I think betting is a fairly natural play. You know, I don't want to give ace king outs, and I just want to win the pot right now. But I was thinking to myself after that, you know, if they check raised here, that's really a gross spot. I, I actually, I, I would hate my life if they check raised here because I, I literally don't know what I should do. It's it, at, in one, on one hand, I would, you know, I would be inclined to fold because it's kind of weird for them to want to check raise me here. I think without um, having, it, without having like a bigger pair or a flush draw with lots of outs. But at the same time, it's just, you know, why would they check pocket aces to me here? Maybe to try to trap me. So um, it would have been a really gross spot, I think, if I got check raised. And by that argument, I think against a very tricky player who could be check raising here as a trap and as a bluff with a balanced strategy, maybe checking is better just to protect myself from that. But 
I think against him, I was reasonably confident nothing crazy was going to happen. Um, and yeah, so they just fold. Okay, so it's against this guy again. I guess we're playing a lot of pots against the same player. Um, I think it's getting fairly late into the tournament at this point. It's not a huge tournament, maybe like 80, 90 players, and it's probably down to like 20, 25 at this point. So they raise, we call with queen eight off. We're a bit deep here, so our reverse implied odds are actually sort of bad, but um, but we decided to call. And we flop two, three, five, so I'm just gonna fold here, but they decided to check, and then we turn a flush draw, but I'm still just gonna check and basically bet <coughs> bet pretty much every river. Um, maybe not an eight river, but... So we river a six, and I essentially bet as a bluff because our hand has no hope of winning if if it gets to showdown. And and it works this time, so... So yeah, we played a lot of pots against them, and it seems like they are fairly willing to just um, check and fold their hands, so not too aggressive. So I guess one thing to keep in mind is maybe we should <coughs> get out of the way if we do see them raising. <coughs> Um, okay, so this situation is similar to the situation, the very first hand we discussed, where we had king-queen, and we had roughly 30 big blinds, and I talked sort of about the benefits of raising versus calling. It's pretty much the exact same situation, and I decided to sort of raise, essentially as a bluff, but also king-queen plays pretty well when they do call, um, because I'm always good when I hit top pair. So we make it 8,000. But unfortunately, this time, this Gerard Dox goes all in. So we basically just have to fold. And um, yeah, unfortunately, 8,000 is small enough where we can just happily get away here. And it actually turns out this guy also goes all in, which makes the decision even easier. So yeah, it looks like we ran into <laughs> pocket aces and pocket kings that time. So it doesn't always work when you re-raise with king queen. Um, All right, so still at the same table, we get Ace Jack offsuit under the gun. We re-raise, and this uh, Javar Dox guy calls. We flop King Nine Deuce with two hearts, and I think this is sort of pretty much the worst flop. I one of the worst flops I could get. Um, you know, if there if there was like two higher cards, like a king and a queen, I would have a gut shot straight draw. And if it was all low cards, I'd have two over cards. But here, there's a flush draw that I have no part of. And also, they're somewhat likely to have a king. And if they do, I only have three outs in my aces. So I'm just going to give this up. You know, So I talked about the power of continuation betting before, where continuation betting is good because my range is stronger than theirs. I can have aces. I can bluff, etc. And yeah, in general, continuation betting, being aggressive, especially when you're, you're the preflop aggressor, is very good. But I think this is just one of the worst flops. And I'm, I'm just going to give up. Um, so I check, they bet, and I fold. Um, I mean, I think sometimes I will check a reasonably good hand here to protect the time, so, you know, so, so that they can't just bet here with any two cards and know for sure I'll fold. But most of the time when I'm checking here, I'm going to be fairly weak, which is maybe exploitable, but uh, I give up the hand. So 8-5 suited. I decided to call on the small blind. Um, I know this goes against my recommendation from the first class, I think calling from the small blind is actually both theoretically and practically a pretty good strategy for a lot of cases, but it's a bit complicated because you have to sometimes, like, you have to sometimes limp raise as a bluff, you have to sometimes limp raise and trap with aces, so it's a bit complicated. So I, I just said for simplicity, you have to, you should just raise or fold, which is still reasonable, I think, but I decided to call here and it's checked. We get a pretty good flop for our hand, but Probably a better flop for his range, because when we call, we're less likely to have really small cards than he does. But, I mean, we have a good flop for our hand, so I, I'm still going to bet my two hands. So I bet um, I bet half pot, which is maybe not big enough, to be honest, considering how dry the board is. And we get a call. We turn a nine, which is a great card. Because um, it's, it gives, not only does it complete our hand, there's a lot of draws out there. And I bet quite big here. So this is where I was talking about if the board is dry, you need to bet big and not give your opponent odds. So I bet 688 into 10800. Um, the reason for the eights is because it's easier to type like 6888 than 6800. So <laughs> you'll see that quite a lot in non Um And we get called. 
Yeah, and another sometimes you can get more creative. You can do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's like a popular bet because you can just slide your finger across the <laughs> keyboard. Um, yeah, there's a lot of weird idiosyncrasies, but okay. So I bet fifteen five fifty five here, and um, he folds. And yeah, so I mean, I'm playing. I'm playing like this with my missed spade draws, my missed heart draws, and unfortunately, we don't get paid off. Okay, so Jack eight suited here. The small blind raises. Definitely, I'm gonna call, and we flop top pair. They bet, and so I think this is so. This is a spot where you know I think my hand is. There's benefits of raising and benefits of calling, and overall, I decided the benefits of raising were higher, so I decided to raise and just get it all in. Although I think calling is not unreasonable because your hand sort of isn't good enough where you're just like. Really, really happy to get it all in. I mean, it's good enough where I'm gonna get it all in, but I'm not like thrilled if they go all in and I have to call. So that's one disadvantage of getting it all in. But I just think compared to the advantage of you know not giving them a chance to to suck out on me and beat me in the hand is a pretty big advantage. You know, not letting a queen king or ace roll off. Um, another advantage of calling is being able to pick off bluffs, but. I just think in this flop, I want to play a strategy where I'm gonna raise to a small size and put him to the decision, both with my top pairs like jacks and also my hands like seven nine or whatever. So I decided to raise, but I think calling would have been fine and they fold. The next hand we have ace king. All right, so we got like seven more hands. Yeah, so I'll I'll go a bit quickly near the end, but. I think we'll get through all the hands. Uh, this hand is fairly easy. They, they make it 5,000, and we have ace-king, and we just go all in. There's no point still playing, essentially, um, especially when, you know, if they have jack-10, they have lots of outs. So we go on, and they fold. So it is a bit curious here, because they actually only had 12 big blinds here. So they could have just went all in themselves, but they decided to raise small so that they could fold if someone behind picks up a monster, and I guess they were paid off this time. Um, But yeah, like for this hand, like one disadvantage of their play, right? Like suppose we had king two suited, we would have folded if they went all in. But now we can call and see a flop. So, but it, but for because we had ace king, then I guess they profited from not committing their whole stack. Okay, we have king jack offsuit. We make it six thousand, and this guy goes all in. I, I fold here. I think it's not that close. I think with king jack suited, it's close. But I'd still fold with king jack suited. I'd probably call with ace jack offsuit plus. I would probably call with ace 10 suited, and I'd call with king queen suited, and probably king queen offsuit as well. Um, in this case, so in the last class, I said being suited is very important when you're behind, but when you're potentially ahead, just having a slightly better hand is very important. So I think in this situation, I would fold king jack suited, but call with king queen offsuit because. A decent part of his range is hands like king jack and king queen. So, okay, here I have king queen and degenerated. So, I, for some reason, I love making this play with king queen. Um, it's actually not that unfounded. It's just a good hand to bluff with that at the same time <coughs> sort of protects your range in the case that he calls. And also, your hand doesn't play that well if you just call because you're not suited. So it's it, it really is king. I mean, in this tournament, we've happened to got we've happened to been dealt king queen a lot and gone into situations where we can uh, re raise bluff people. But it really is my favorite hand to do this with. So it, it might be even be too predictable because I just always have king queen whenever I do this. Um, <laughs> but we do take it down here. Okay, ace jack offsuit. This guy, so this degenerated guy who we just re at this point, it's probably late enough in the tournament. I am paying attention and I am aware that I just re raised this guy three hands earlier. So they, they make a big raise here to 9,000, and I call with ace jack, which I regret quite a bit, I think. <laughs> it's just, I think it's just too weak a hand to play, and if I'm gonna play it, I think I should just go all in and try to win the hand preflop. This is, even though I'm in position, I think it's just gonna be hard to play. Um, you know, even when I hit an ace or a jack, I'm still gonna quite often be behind. And if I don't hit an ace or a jack, I'm pretty much always just gonna have to fold. And that's basically what happens. So I don't know why I just gave away 9,000 chips there, but. 
Okay, so queen jack suited. I just go all in from the small blind because it's. So even though we have 15 big blinds, which is more than 12, I said last class that from the small blind, you're really, really, really incentivized to go all in because if you don't, then the other guy has position. Whereas like from the button, if you just raise the big blind calls, you have position. So I go all in. Queen Jack suited is more than good enough. And so we get a fold. And the next hand, okay, so this is actually a great illustration. The very next hand, we get Queen Jack off and we just raise from this button. And it's exactly the reason I said, because we have position. So we don't mind if the pot gets played post-flop. So the small blind goes all in, and note, note that they're actually fairly short here. They only have 14 big blinds to start the hand. So I, I would have easily called with queen jack suited. Even with queen jack off, I'm not certain that folding is a better play than calling. It's just your odds are basically good enough here, and their range will be fairly loose when I raise from the button because they're going to think I don't have much when I raise from the button. So it's quite possible calling here would have been the right play. It's very close. I think I would have definitely called with ace nine offsuit. I would have definitely called with king ten offsuit. Um, yeah, it's pretty close. I decided to fold. Maybe I also knew that they were kind of tight. Um, normally when I play, but I'm not showing here, is I have like statistics on every player of like overall the hands, what percent of the time they raise, what percent they folded. So I have a rough idea while I'm playing um, of how tight everyone is. And maybe I just knew he was tight. Actually, let me see if I can turn it back on here. Yeah, let me see. That might be why. Uh, so, so at this, okay, so these numbers, actually he's fairly loose. Yeah, I actually, I'm not sure why I folded. So this 10.7 is his re-raise percentage. And what this says is 10.7% of the time he could have re-raised, he re-raised. It's only over a sample of 187 hands, but it's, it's all, yeah, I think it's definitely looser than average. Um, although it's a bit biased because we're playing at a five handed table. Um, nonetheless, it's close. I think calling probably would have been okay. But I folded. Let me turn this off. It's quite annoying. Um, okay, so so this is near the final table now. This is, I think, the second final table. There's maybe like 11 or 12 left. And I'm just going to show you the final hands before the final table. So this hand is a no-brainer. We go all in. And fortunately, we hold against pocket twos. So um, okay, so the, the very last hand, uh, also fairly <laughs> no-brainer. This guy goes all in. So yeah, poker is easy if you just get dealt pocket jacks, pocket pieces all the time. Um, so we win this one. Okay, so this is the last hand before the final table. So in a future class, not the Friday class because Jennifer Shahade is speaking, but uh, in a future class, I'll go through the final table and I'll maybe also go through all the hands, not just the hands where I got in a big pot. So um, let me just quickly go back to the slides. Right, so, so I really only talked about two concepts in this class. It was this draw, draw you versus dry boards. So try to remember that while you guys are playing, the changing your bet sizing depending on the board texture, and also this pre-flop re-raising strategy. Even though I didn't give you a conclusion here on what to re-raise with, um, I should give you some rough guidelines and the advantages and disadvantages of each play. And yeah, okay, cool. So that's it. Uh, come on Friday's class. It should be should be really exciting. Uh, Jennifer Shahade. She'll probably talk a bit about chess as well, but I'll convince her not to talk too much about chess when it's a poker <laughs> class. But uh, thanks, guys.